Let me start by, by thanking you for, for deciding to, to spend your, your evening with me, especially as I know that there's um, supposedly a basketball game going on. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But since UW is not in it, I guess uh, you know, it's just, uh, uh, other things can occupy your attention. I also want to, to very profoundly thank um, Super and the AAUP and the, the many sponsoring departments. It's, it's really a, a pleasure to be here in this uh, wonderful space and this uh, wonderful city. And a special thanks to uh, uh, Professor Shandan Reddy for, for all of his work. Not only did he help put this together, but he helped set up an, a number of events here in the Pacific Northwest in both Oregon and, and Washington. And he's, he's worked extraordinarily hard and he's way too um, civil to, to say it out loud, but I'm not the easiest person in the world with whom to um, make a schedule. Um, quite <laughs> frankly, I stink at it. And so, um, you know, his, his, um, all of his, his work and support and friendship are much appreciated. So I, I know that there's a lot of interest in my case or my um, situation with the University of Illinois. We've been calling it a situation, and I, I find that a particularly amusing euphemism, but uh, that's kind of what it's morphed to. But I, I want to situate this situation in, in a broader context and look at a constellation of issues that informed the university's decision in the first place and that have continued to inform the conversation that has occurred over the past seven or so months. I'm happy during the, um, the Q&A to answer something specific about my um, case, if anybody is curious, or to address something that, that I didn't address or that I won't address during my prepared comments here. Just line up and, and, and ask. The first thing that folks think of in reflecting on the University of Illinois decision to uh, term terminate my um, faculty, tenured faculty appointment is the matter of academic freedom. So a few thoughts on academic freedom before moving into some contextual issues. First, academic freedom is not settled. It doesn't have a singular definition. It's not something that, that has a d direct relationship with um, the, the, the US Constitution, and, it's, and it's, a, it's a idea and a practice whose, whose uh, connotations are, are, are not always in alignment with, with reality or with um, university policy. Oh, OK. So it's, uh, you know, so. Okay, okay, yeah, that's okay. I thought that I was like, uh, maybe somebody uh, uh, brought in some, some uh, audio of the basketball game. That sounded like a, 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 the buzzer going off. Um, I was gonna get ready to ask who won, but uh, anyway. Uh, so, you know, sometimes life forces us into circumstances where, where we, we seek expertise in things about which we would have otherwise had lesser or little interest. And with me and academic freedom, it's been that way. I, I had a, I've always had a basic understanding of academic freedom ever since I entered into uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the profession. But after August 2nd when I received the, the, of last year, when I received the termination letter, I began researching academic freedom, its histories, um, the way that different folks have theorized it, the way that it, it, it has been practiced and contested and defined and redefined. And there's one thing that I constantly encounter in reading about academic freedom. It's that whatever else it does, Everybody agrees that academic freedom is essential to the conduct of scholarly work and pedagogy. That if we are restricted to viewpoints that inform a particular status quo or supplement a particular center of 
power, then we are limited in our ability to do our jobs the way that they were supposed to be done. In the humanities and social sciences particularly, but this is also true certainly of the hard sciences, and it's true also of students, graduate students, instructors in addition to tenured faculty, we have a mandate to push boundaries of commonplace thought. We have an interest in deconstructing the parameters and assumptions of the status quo. And if we are doing our work in a useful and interesting way, we are also identifying and critiquing centers of power. And it's the recrimination of those centers of power that makes academic freedom critical to our work. But academic freedom has never been consistently practiced. It's done largely a good job of protecting those who might be seen as, as unorthodox from recrimination, but it's never done a good job of protecting systematic critique of state power. You go back to even before the McCarthy era that saw so many professors getting fired and you'll find that litmus tests, administrative and political litmus tests existed that very much limited the range of, of speech and research in which faculty could engage. Through the McCarthy era, of course, people's loyalty to American patriotism was constantly tested and dozens of academics were fired from either tenure track or tenured positions. A case that is similar to mine at base but uh, much worse, much, much harsher is that of Angela Davis who in 1969 was beginning work as a, an assistant professor of philosophy at UCLA. And the, the University of California Board of Regents, um, under the, uh, with the urging of then governor Ronald Reagan, fired her for her affiliation with, or her membership in the Communist Party, and also her affiliation with the Black Panther Party. So it's kind of a double whammy. Angela Davis ended up getting falsely indicted for murder, beat the rap on, on those phony charges, ended up back at UCLA, and then ended up getting fired again. And the reason for her firing a second time was because the UC Board of Regents cited inflammatory language. That's the, the rationale. And you can, we can see inflammatory language acting as something of a precursor for the new discourse of, of civility that has arisen in, in the administrative vocabulary. Basically, if one seeks to examine police brutality or militarism or structural rather than just interpersonal racism, if one criticizes Israel, and let me be even more specific, because plenty of people have criticized Israel without paying any penalty, but what really gets you in trouble is criticizing Zionism. If one criticizes Zionism, right? if one criticizes continued US and Canadian colonization, and the complicity of multinational corporations in the continuation of that colonization and in environmental destruction, one might possibly end up without the full protection of academic freedom. If you look at the cases of people who have been fired or harassed over the past 25 years, inevitably they fit one of those categories or, or many of them all at once. I'm not the first person this hap has happened to vis-a-vis -vis Palestine, of course. Right? Um, another noteworthy case is that of, of Norman Finkelstein, I think in 2006 and 2007, was, it was uh, his, fail his tenure case, his tenure bid at DePaul University failed because he, his supposed lack of collegiality. And here again, we can see the relationship or correlation between collegiality and civility, but 
If you look at William Robinson, a sociologist at UC Santa Barbara, you can look at Terry Ginsburg, who was fired from North Carolina State for, for statements critical of Israel. You can look at, um, really, uh, uh, David Schroeder of UCLA. There, there have been dozens of people, going back to, to before the heyday of Edward Said, who have either been fired or been denied tenure, or in some cases, and we forget this often, never got a job in the first place. And we know that this sort of cloud exists. It has in academe for quite some time. It does outside of academe. Just ask Jim Clancy from CNN or the Reverend Bruce Shipman at Yale who was fired from his chaplainship for, our, for, for criticizing Israel's Operation Protective Edge last summer. Or ask Rabbi Brant Rosen who was forced to leave his synagogue because of of criticisms he made of, of protective edge. So these sorts of things have been happening and they are systematic and they are undertaken in the name of a particular discourse, not simply of civility, right, but of multicultural splendor. Right? They, they evoke these liberal discourses of safe spaces and comfort Right? And uh, unity and dialogue and peace and coexistence. But in the end, their primary stock in trade, or the primary stock in trade of those who seek to stifle the speech rights of advocates of Palestinian human rights is unfettered charges of anti-Semitism. This, too, has been a long-standing tactic. It's problematic for many reasons. One of the reasons it's troublesome is that it conflates Jewish cultural identity, Jewish religion, Jewish ethnicity with the practices of the state of Israel. We should not want those conflations to be made, no matter our national or cultural or ethnic background. I, for example, am a citizen of Jordan in addition to the United States. And when people criticize the Jordanian king or the Jordanian government, I don't feel attacked on an ethnic or cultural level. I believe that people should criticize the king and the Jordanian government and the American government and any other government and any other state actor without that sort of criticism being juxtaposed with an attack on an ethnic community if you are basing a sort of cultural identity on the practices and behaviors of the state of Israel, you are putting yourself in a terrible position. Because the practices of the state of Israel have been and continue to be deeply violent and very often rise to the level or descend to the level of war crimes as numerous journalists and human rights reports of the past year indicate. Anti-Semitism is a very real phenomenon and a phenomenon about which we should all be deeply concerned and for which we should be against or which we should profoundly oppose but in the context of painting critics of Israel or Zionism with a broad brush it's largely a rhetorical technique that's intended to shut down conversation and shutting down conversation is the stock and trade of a host of pro-Israel organizations, and there are a number of them that focus on academe. Two things uh, stand out in, in, in my mind, in my experience, for thinking about these matters. One is the American Studies Association uh, academic boycott resolution of, of December 2013, and then Israel's intensive bombardment of the Gaza Strip over 51 days last summer, in which over 2,000 Palestinians were killed, anywhere from 519 to 538 of them children, it led to um, massive property damage and destruction, and it led to an intensive suffering in the territory that continues today, a territory that is periodically subject to this kind of blanket bombing and that, that has suffered tremendously already. And there are lots of ways that we can go about it. Let me, let me focus on discourses. I started to notice this during the debate around the American Studies Resolution. I was involved in that. You know, I was part of the core group of, of faculty who were, um, who were pushing the resolution, and then I wrote a number of pieces 
justifying the, you know, the, the resolution or defending the resolution after it had been passed. Um, and there's plenty of reason to believe that, that that vocal support of this particular resolution is what landed me in hot water in the first place, and that, uh, and that the, the, the targeting of me uh, precedes my um, recent Twitter activity. But I noticed during the debate, just as I noticed during the political conversations around Operation Protective Edge, that very few people these days defend Israel's actions. See, they defend the idea of Israel. They defend the honor of Israel. They defend the sort of uh, existential realities of Israel, right? but they don't actually defend Israel's actions or Israel's behavior. During the conversation around the ASA resolution, for example, I heard plenty of people opposing the, 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 the resolution, the proposed resolution, but they, very few people, if any, were saying, right, during the ASA events that meant to discuss it, I don't think any of them were saying what these people, pro-resolution folks, are saying about Israeli universities being complicit in the occupation is not true. What they're saying about Israel being an occupying force, or even having a military occupation, is not true. You just weren't hearing those sorts of arguments. What you were hearing were arguments like, is it the role of a scholarly group to pass this sort of resolution? And when it came to ASA, the answer was, was, was a simple yes. Right? It had done it tons of times. You also heard uh, you know, arguments like, well, you know, scholarly groups shouldn't be political. Right? which is an old standby for the crowd that wants a, a, a certain sort of self-serving politics to be centered right, in, 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 a, in a particular institution and everybody else is to be silent or marginalized. You also heard that advocates of the boycott are singling out Israel. That's another common argument. You know, why shouldn't we be boycotting um, North Korea or China or Cuba? Because U.S. universities have tons of formal relationships with Cuba, North Korea. Um, you know, I'm telling I'm, 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 you, know, no, I'm, I'm, this is true. Like, I've been noticing this for years, and no, nobody, nobody cares more profoundly for the people of North Korea and Tibet than a Zionist who's just heard Israel get criticized. You know, like, that's, you know, then that's when, uh, you know, the, the whataboutery begins, right? Um, so you were hearing these kinds of arguments, and, and, I, and I registered. I, this is an interesting way to argue, right? It's, an interesting, it's interesting to defend a state based on, on these abstract concerns of, of existential angst, right? Rather than on the matters of policy that are being introduced and, and critiqued by the other side. Then Protective Edge rolled around, and I saw a similar phenomenon. Uh, Israel really took a beating in public relations during, during that period. U.S. Democrats at this point, various studies have, surveys, recent surveys have shown are pro-Palestinian or identifying as pro-Palestinian rather than pro-Israel at a rate of anywhere from 60 to 68 percent these days. These are U.S. Democrats. That's a remarkable number. That's a remark that, that could be described as a sea change in public attitudes towards Israel. Of course, the, the U.S. left and the global left has always been pro-Palestine, but Israel is increasingly becoming an issue of the Tea Party right. right? That's where it's being defended. Right? That's where it is drawing the, the, the majority of its popular support. And during Protective Edge, people were seeing news stories profoundly critical of Israel in media spaces that could normally be relied upon to sanitize or whitewash Israeli violence. People were taking to their social media and seeing pictures of, of, of you know, Palestinian infants and toddlers being blown to smithereens. They were seeing these photos of, of little boys in Gaza whose corpses were being stored in an ice cream freezer. And they were being stored in ice cream freezers because the morgues had run out of space and because Gaza had no electricity. And in the summer's heat, they were going to rapidly decompose and create an ongoing or an even worse health crisis. People were engaged with these images. They were seeing these images. And Israel's public defenses of that operation were, in, you could describe them as existing somewhere between depraved and risible. I remember 
when Naftali Bennett, I think he's the Israeli Minister of Finance, he's a mainstream politician, he's, he's not off on, on the margins somewhere. All right. He was on with Wolf Blitzer, and this is uh, right after the four Palestinian boys were, were blown up when they were playing on the beach in Gaza, right? which, which resulted in all kinds of worldwide condemnation for Israel, as well it should have, because by every standard, it was a war crime. And Wolf Blitzer asked Bennett about the four boys, but Bennett didn't answer the question, he didn't mention the four boys. He went into a diatribe about how the Arabs have in their houses missile launcher rooms. And he kept going on about the missile launcher room. And he's seen the missile launcher room because, of course, he served in Israel's invasion in, in Lebanon. Uh, and, and while he was uh, on that, uh, on that uh, adventure, he, he saw the Arab missile launcher room. And even Wolf Blitzer was like, WTF, right? Wolf Blitzer, you know, like, <laughs> Wolf Blitzer looked like, he looked like Mike Myers when Kanye West said that George Bush doesn't like black people. You know, he was just like, you know, and I remember, it's like, wow, you know, that's, 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 that's a remarkable narrative, Bennett. That's, you know, your knowledge of the enemy is just stunning because, and I thought about my childhood, you know, and, because I, you know, I was born in the U.S. and so I've, I've always had that, that, that kind of angst about my ethnic uh, credibility, you know, and I was thinking, you know, I was like, well, where was our missile launcher room? And I was like, shit, our missile launcher room was off by the master suite. But, you know, to true Arabs, the missile launcher room's got to be next to the nursery. And it's always got to be around children. And then, but then I started thinking about some of my Arab-American friends, and I realized some of them didn't have missile launcher rooms at all. And lo and behold, but those are the ones who grew up, right, as, as, as total sellouts and assimilationists. You know, the, the, the true Arabs, you know, they, they had that, that missile launcher, like the people in Gaza. You know, especially on the lower floors of those towering apartment blocks because, you know, I guess they like to launch missiles across, you know, the two foot wide alleyway at, at, you know, at the, the apartment in front of theirs. But this is, a, this is the level of rationalization that we were getting, all right? This is only one example of many, all right? The level of rationalization that we were getting during Protective Edge, all right? This is from a mainstream Israeli politician, okay? You have Netanyahu recently, you know, uh, uh, calling to arms during the Israeli election, right? And I have a hard time calling it an election because uh, the Palestinians of the West Bank and Gaza couldn't vote. Um, saying the Arabs are coming to the, 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 the polls in droves, all right? You know, and, and these sorts of statements are, are revealing a side to Israel that has normally been precluded from corporate media coverage in the U.S. But during Protective Edge, very few people were defending Israel's actions. Right? I didn't hear Naftali Bennett or, or the rest of the collection of talking heads saying things like, no, no, 519 Palestinian children didn't die. We didn't, you know, no, no, Israel's not shooting, you know, UN shelters and schools, right? Uh, Israel's not doing any of these things. That's false. Nobody was arguing that. What were they saying instead? You all remember that it's the Palestinians' fault. But it's Hamas, Hamas, Hamas. Hamas is putting children up on buildings. Hamas is putting children here. Hamas is putting children there. This is not a defense. Whatever else you might call it, it doesn't constitute a defense. In fact, it sounds an awful lot like a very derivative 500-year-old colonial discourse that every colonizer has used to explain how he was pure of soul until he encountered the native who transformed him into a heretofore unimaginable corruption and damn it made him do things that he never would have thought possible. Right? So the, the Palestinian corrupted the Israeli and forced the Israeli to kill the Palestinian children because Palestinians, you can finish the sentence for me, don't value human life. All right? Call it what you want, you cannot call it a defense. All right? So what do you do when you cannot win the debate? And make no mistake, I would say that the pro-Israel camp has lost the debate. They've lost it. Based on journalism, based on human rights reports, based on public perception, based on experience, based on eyewitness accounts, based on dozens and dozens and dozens of, of, of meticulous scholarly work, all right? It is impossible at this point to say with a straight face 
that Israel did not displace anywhere from 700 to 800,000 Palestinians upon its founding, that right? it's not engaged in a military occupation and settlement program that, that violates every relevant international law, that it has not largely been the aggressor, and that it has done nothing but reach out towards the Palestinians in peace, only to receive a cold, unwelcoming hand in return. That narrative is done. Uh, that narrative is done. If you cannot win the debate based on facts, based on evidence, right? And I've seen all the, the, the pro-Israel propaganda sheets that they hand out and say, go say this, go do that, right? I've never seen one that said, stick to the facts. Uh, and I, honestly, it never said, stick to the facts. Invoke evidence, right? Uh, these are never on there, right? These are never on there. Uh, but there are no evidence to evoke. But you shut down the conversation. You don't even let the conversation get off the ground. And you punish and silence those who are bringing uncomfortable facts to your attention and to the attention of the general public. You smear them with ad hominem about them being anti-Semitic, right? And you punish them, not just to silence them, but to be punitive. Because my firing and everybody who's involved in work around the Israel-Palestine conflict, whether they're pro-Israel or pro-Palestine, knows this. They know that this is a lifetime punishment. As soon as word leaks out that I'm up for another job, you don't think the exact same thing's gonna happen? You think they're gonna say, okay, well, we got him at Illinois, well, we'll let him get a job at University X. Uh-uh. You get marked with a particular discourse, a particular narrative, and it follows you. And so you shut the conversation down. Now, what's of interest to us, or I think of, of tremendous interest to us, should be of tremendous interest to us, is the, are the narratives that go into these acts of administrative repression. Because make no mistake, administrators are not only complicit in these restrictions on academic freedom, but they are progenitors of these restrictions on academic freedom. If you need any evidence, just think about the fact that Every major scholarly association in the country and many around the world, the AAUP, right, tons of faculty senates have come out against the University of Illinois decision, but not a single upper administrator at a single U.S. university has done the same. All right? That's where the battle lines are drawn. But the discourse of civility is particularly interesting to me, especially as an updating of the, the language of, of inflammatory language or, or uh, collegiality. Civility strikes me as more insidious because it's slightly less honest and direct. At least when they fired Angela Davis for inflammatory language, right? We had something to work with, right? You know, but when they say civility, I think they deploy that language, administrators, and they're using it all over the place now. You know, once, you know, but it's been in existence since before my firing, but after it, it's spread through administrative offices quicker than, 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 than settlers uh, spread through the North American continent, right? It's just, just, just caught and gone, you know? And, and the, one of the reasons for that is, is because it's a fundamentally ambiguous word. It's the word that we recognize as something bad, right? But it doesn't compel its user to explain what's bad about it. It's supposed to be self-evident. So you just invoke civility and then that's it. The conversation ends. But our job, right, as, as, as people interested in academe and interested in ideas, as students and teachers, is to think about the different ways that a term like civility connotes and where it connotes. And so I like to remind people that I was hired in the American Indian Studies program. And in the context of American Indian histories, a term like civility certainly has tons of baggage, right? <laughs> civil, uncivil, civilized, uncivilized, right? Civilized, savage, civilized, barbaric. These binaries were, and in many ways continue to be, the lingua franca of conquest, right? They were every place European colonization occurred. That's the discursive rationale, really in lots of ways a moral rationale for undertaking the colonial project in the first place. And so in the context of American studies, 
We can look at a term like civility and try to think through its implications. And, and, and we might reach the conclusion that, that for a field that's engaged in the work of decolonization, that an adherence to civility is, is very problematic indeed. That, in fact, it might prevent those in the field of, of American Indian studies and other fields from doing what it is that people in the field do, right? Which is to deconstruct discourses like this, to focus on, on the ways that, that a colonialist and totalizing language of conquest continue to circulate and influence our common sense ideas of U.S. history and the U.S. present. And I don't believe that administrators were consciously aware of those connotations when they decided to trot out civility. That doesn't let them off the hook. That makes the use of the term all the more insidious. It means that there's a particular colonial logic that governs the common sense wisdom of running academe. And people are not aware, consciously aware, of that logic. And we can detect and understand that logic based on the terminologies of this new administrative vocabulary. That's how racism reproduces itself. It doesn't reproduce itself when Paula Dean says something stupid, right? It doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't, uh, it, does, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't even produce itself when, when Andrew Harrison gets caught whispering at a microphone, right? Racism is constantly reproduced through unexamined vocabularies of, in some cases, civility, right? That's the way that it reproduces itself. And I've been, if, I, if you can in, indulge um, selfish uh, personal rambling, I've been deeply grateful and flattered for all the, the, the support that, that I've received. And honestly, I'm going go to go to my grave always remembering it as, as that, that support as, as just a, a, a beautiful moment in my life despite uh, the difficult circumstances in, in, in which I received it. But, um, I always ask people to, to really reserve that, that uh, love and, and kinship for the folks in American Indian Studies at Illinois, that they've really borne the brunt of, of, of this racism. I don't believe, and I have no empirical evidence for this, but I still feel strongly about it. I don't believe that this could have happened were I in a STEM field like, you know, uh, uh, civic engineering. Is it civil engineering? I don't even see, I don't even know, right? I, I obviously couldn't be in one of those fields in the first place. Um, you know, a STEM field like mathematics, uh, you know. The, and I also don't, don't think that it could have happened or happened with such ease had I been in a more traditional humanities discipline such as English. The fact that it happened in American Indian Studies tells us a lot about the status of American Indian studies and ethnic studies more broadly, right, in the eyes of, of administrators in our new neoliberal corporatized universities. And not only are they, uh, not only do they not bring in the funds, the much needed funds that privatization demands, right, but they also actively work against these neoliberal corporatizing processes. And at Illinois, they've, they've been embroiled with administration and with the community over Chief Illini Wick for, for many years, the chief, and they, they really love the chief in, in, in Illinois. They formally retired him, I think, in 2007, by force, the administration did, but Chief Illini Wick is everywhere. I visited Champaign-Urbana four times, okay, uh, once to, uh, twice, actually, to find a place to, to live. For those of you who think I wasn't hired, they paid for all four of them. Um, you know, an awful, awful amount of largesse for, for somebody who they were just considering at that point. Um, and I saw Chief Illini Wick everywhere. He was on the back of, of, of spare tires, on the backs of Jeeps, and banners, and t-shirts, and the Chief is everywhere. And he turns up to, uh, he turns up to uh, sporting events sometimes. Somebody in the crowd will dress up like the Chief. So there's a Facebook page with like, last I saw like 83,000 likes. De devoted to, to the revival of, of the chief. And 
At one post, uh, the chief showed up at a football game, and I was reading the comments. I remember thinking, and I was thinking this without snark, and, and I convey the thought to you without snark, I promise. I'm, I'm not even trying to be a, a, a jerk about it. I remember thinking, well, these poor folks don't need an Indian mascot. They need a grief counselor, right? Really. So much of their, their sense of self is, is wrapped up in this, what amounts to a corporate image. It's a corporatized image, and so it's, it's, it's a wonderful metonym of, of, of who gets to control history and who gets to control a discourse and maintaining your, your, your identity as, as, as part of the majoritarian community and not allowing these nattering ethnic groups free reign to make changes, right, because those changes forebode, portend, Right? All kinds of, of, of problematic precedents. The same thing happened during the ASA boycott resolution, by the way, or something similar. That there was a lot of hand-wringing about the browning of the ASA and how the new demographics of the field of American study, studies were contributing to this sort of nonsense, you know, like uh, uh, you know, saying mean things about Israel. Right? That you know, if the true stewards of the field had still been in charge, this kind of nonsense never would have been allowed to happen. And so think about American Indian studies, but also Think about a lot of the suggestions about American Indian studies that exist among supporters of the U of I administration. You know, they seem like they're insults directed at me, but they're not really. They're insults directed at the people in AIS at Illinois and the field of American Indian studies more broadly. So when they say Salida wasn't qualified, or they say that there was nepotism involved in the hire, or whatever other uh, uh, procedural nonsense that, that they want to cite, um, what they're really saying is, hey, I'm a jackass with a keyboard. I think I'm going to snap my fingers and render myself an expert on indigenous studies. Because that's just what we do with fields like that. Right? Anybody can become an expert. Second, they're saying that American Indian Studies faculty shouldn't be allowed to make autonomous hiring decisions the way every other department on campus does, that they need the oversight of their sager and more responsible administrative superiors, right? that they need people to sort of lend a hand in these complicated processes that they obviously don't have the bona fides to undertake on their own. It looks a lot like an allegory of federal Indian policy, except it's not actually allegorical. Right? And so, if, 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 so if you take all of the assumptions sort of underlying these, these narratives, it tells us again about how American Indian and Indian studies fit right, into these paradigms of, of the corporate university. Finally, and I'm going to go ahead and, and wrap up soon so we can have time for, for questions. I don't want to bend your ears too much. I'm glad that there's a clock back there for me to keep my eye on. Um, one thing that the, the, the U of I administrators kept pointing to that, that I found particularly bothersome was the fact that they were doing this on behalf of the students. Right? The Jewish students, particularly, and they kept saying the Jewish students, and and I found that doubly, doubly troublesome. First of all, because there's been zero evidence ever produced that that I've ever uh, ever been an inappropriate classroom teacher. The, the the evidence simply is not there. I've I've been teaching in colleges since 1997, and I have zero complaints uh, against me from, from, from students or from my peers or from my superiors. It hasn't happened. But, um, and so you think about the standards of evidence. Like when you, The first thing you learn in, in English 101 is that you know, claims, particularly extraordinary claims, require supporting evidence. So it makes me wonder, it's like, well, who exactly is not qualified to teach college here? Those who are abrogating an entire tradition of academic freedom based on no evidence whatsoever Right? Or, or, or somebody whose teaching record uh, um, in this particular field is spotless. But um, think about what it means when, when administrators invoke students, because they're doing this often these days. And I, I submit that they're not talking about actual human beings, that they're talking about an imagined demographic that serves as something of a stand-in for administrative interests. It, it reminds me actually a lot of how moralists like to point to the children, you know, to do their moralizing, you know, or they want everybody else to, 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 to live according to their moral preferences, so they point to the children, no sex, drugs, rock and roll, you know, no fun, no sin, because the children, 
And it's like, what? You know, I don't wanna, leave the children out of it. I like children. You know, don't make me start hating them. You know, like, uh, leave, the, leave the children out of it, right? You know, if, if you want to be repressive and restrictive, then you do it in your own name. Right? It's cowardly to invoke the children because it's an imagined demographic and it's a powerless demographic, right? You're, you're actually uh, outsourcing responsibility for your shit views to, you know, to, to people who have no agency in this schema, right? And so when administrators invoke the students, it's kind of the same thing. What students are they talking about? What students are they talking about? They're always talking about students who are going to reflect on administrative desires. And second of all, I've been looking out for this. You can tell me if you've heard differently. I'm not saying it's never happened. I'm saying I've never seen it. I have never heard an upper administrator fret about the safety and comfort of a Palestinian student in a Zionist professor's class. All right? Never seen it, never heard it. It's never a consideration. Power is unilateral in these situations. And then let's think about uh, the other assumptions. Let's see about what's, what's, what's being closed off in these possibilities. Administrators want to help students. They want to do well on behalf of students. That's a remarkable claim, actually, given the evidence at our disposal. I'm out of work, you know that, uh, and so I'm thinking about getting into consulting, and so I'm, 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 I'm living outside of DC now where everybody's a consultant. It's, it's, it's kind of creepy, you know, what do you do? I'm a consultant, okay, it was nice to meet you. You know, I, I just, I, I don't know. I don't, you know. There's just something, sorry for any legitimate consultants in here, but in DC, consulting could mean all kinds of things, you know. Uh, anyway, if administrators want to help students, I'm gonna give them some free advice, all right? Number one, if you want to help students, there are much better things you can do than firing me. I don't really think that's going to help students at all, right? Uh, it's just, you know, I'm biased. But why don't upper administrators do something about the predatory system of student loans in which they're complicit? Why don't they, yeah, why don't they act against it? Why don't they, uh, why don't they uh, at least lobby? to get these policies changed. We have students who are leaving college with tens and tens of thousands of dollars of debt, sometimes over $100,000 of debt, and we know that the, one of the first desires of, of any capitalist marketplace is to create a surfeit of people in the community, right, who are dependent on those to whom they're indebted. So it ends up uh, contributing to a particular power structure. So if upper administrators want to help students, they can do something about the administrative bloat that's taken over academe over the past 10, 15, 20 years. In fact, over the past 10 years, administrator to student and administrator to faculty ratios have increased while faculty to student ratios have decreased. They can do something about this administrative bloat. Who pays for that bloat? Well, lots of sources, but one of the sources is students, whose tuition keeps rising, in some cases by double digits per year, which also contributes to the student loan industry. Now you have administrators for everything, upper administrators. It's an entire class of capitalist management deeply invested in the reputation of the institution. And that becomes their primary priority because that is the basis of the financial wealth and largesse that, that, that accrues. Another thing that administrators can do if they really care about the well-being of students is, 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 is quit hiring and mistreating part-time faculty to teach so many classes. Adjuncts, contingent, sessionals, there are all kinds of, of different terminologies, but you know, they do a terrific job. They do a terrific job of political organizing for rights. They do a great job in the classroom, but it is, if you've never taught college, um, take my word for it, it is next to impossible to properly teach five classes a semester, particularly those that are writing intensive, right? And grading, you know, 200 papers every three, four weeks or so, and devote the proper attention to each student individually that that student needs in order to optimize her or his learning. All right? And so now we, we have an increase of, of contingent employees, a decrease of tenure track and tenured faculty. And not only is this financially desirable for upper administration, but it's also politically desirable. Right? Think about it. They end up with an entire class of employee that's not protected by academic freedom. 
that should be protected by academic freedom, te that are hypothetically, technically protected by academic freedom, but in reality aren't. A contingent employee can be terminated basically at the, the whim of her department chair or her dean or the provost or the chancellor or the board of trustees. And so you end up creating a class of, of, of employee that has profound incentive not, not to criticize the administration. And then finally, if they want to help students, I would, I would suggest that they protect academic freedom. Mm -hmm. mm. These spaces that contribute to the process of learning require critical thought. Right? And critical thought requires subversiveness. It just does. You don't like it, you're, you're, if you choose to, to conceptualize critical thought differently, then you're more than likely recycling platitudes and canards. Okay? Critical thought evokes discomfort. Right? Discomfort creates opportunities for intellectual growth. Thus is the educational process, and thus has it been Right, since the days of Socrates, <laughs> possibly even before. I'm going to go ahead and close with a quick, uh, I guess, story, if you will, if you'll humor me, and then we'll, we'll get to the, Q, the Q's and A's. Um, a lot of us get into these fields like indigenous studies or African-American studies or women's and genders and sexuality studies. Uh, not all of us, but a lot of us because of our own experiences of racism or sexism or, or marginalization in some way, and we want, to, we, we want to, to understand those things a little bit better. Where do they come from? Who's invested in them? Who profits from them? How might we end them? And one of the things that attracted me to indigenous studies, among many other things, is, is its, its commitment to the material well-being of the communities with which it's engaged, right? Of uh, its commitment to decolonization and not just to to abstract theorization, which is which is rather anathema to uh, American Indian and Indigenous studies. But um, once I was in Palestine in the early 2000s, and I, I of of my four grandparents, I only grew up really knowing one of them. This is my mom's mom, and she's from Palestine from a village called Ein Kerem, which still exists. In 1948, this is in the west of, of Jerusalem, for, you know, religious folks might know it as, as Ein Kerem as the uh, birthplace of John the Baptist, and it's also the, the site of, of Israel's famous Hadassah Hospital. But um, back in my grandmother's childhood, it was an Arab village, majority Muslim, minority Christian, in 1948, it was depopulated. My grandmother ended up in Jordan. She married my grandfather. They emigrated to Latin America. And two generations later, here I am. And now Ein Kerem is, is a, a majority Jewish village. And it's a suburb of Jerusalem. And it's, it's kind of what I like to call hipster Jerusalem really trendy cafes and restaurants. It's honestly, I'm going to speak frankly, all right, if uncivilly. It's the kind of place that if you've been displaced or dispossessed, right, that, that particularly annoys you, right? You know what I mean, right? The, you know, that, that kind of sort of self-righteous, liberal, you know, hippy-dippy, you know, but profoundly colonized and uh, colonized space and, and fortified space in lots of ways. But um, so I was in Palestine once, um, and it was, it, was a, it was a group of people, we were on a delegation, and we'd gone from the West Bank to Nazareth, on to Haifa, then down the coast to Tel Aviv, and then to Gaza, and then back to the West Bank. And on our way back to the West Bank, we, were, we went through West Jerusalem, and our Palestinian bus driver, I hear him announce, okay, and this is Ein Kerem. You know, I'm like, whoa, whoa, what did you just say? He's like, oh, this is Ein Kerem. I was like, okay, stop the bus, stop the bus, you know, and so I make him stop the bus. He happily complies because Palestinians really don't like schedules, you know, and, uh, and, and you know, it, I make everybody get off the bus and I wander off and I take all kinds of pictures. And I remember thinking, man, my grandmother is going to love this. She's going to love this. My cousins are going to hate me. This is going to be wonderful. I'm totally going to be her favorite. And... You know, I, I take a whole bunch of pictures, uh, wander around the place. We get back in the bus, and about a week later, I'm back home. And so I ran 
you know, like the first or second day I was there, I ran to the drugstore to develop the film. And but with college students, uh, film is like just translucent, <laughs> it's like, like a roll of something, you know, you, it's kind of translucent. And when, when it was ready, like you put it in a black tube and you, you would take it, you would take it. No, I'm not lying. This is true. You would take, you would, you would take it like to the drugstore or to the Walmart or whatever or get, and give the guy or the gal, you know, behind the counter like extra money. And an hour later, you'd get your pictures. You know, uh, yeah, it was, it was called uh, one hour developing. It was like this really big thing back then. And you know, if Shandon will have me back, I'll come back next week and we'll talk about phone booths. Um, you know, this is, you know, it's, uh, well, you know, those used to exist too. So I, I, I developed the film. I rush home and, and I hand the, the envelope, the sealed envelope, to my grandmother. And she's just like, I'm just like, look, look, check them out. And she opens it up and she flips through a few pictures and she really doesn't know what she's looking at. You know, she knows it has something to do with Palestine, but it could be Bethlehem, it could be Haifa, it could be anything. And she looks through a few more and she's starting to recognize. And then she flips through a few more and she totally knows what, what, what she's looking at and her face just goes stony, silent, right? And, and, and the emotion uh, uh, leaves her face. And she took the pictures and she kind of restacked them and put them in the envelope and sealed it and without saying a word, handed the packet back to me. And that's the last time that I've spoken about Palestine with, with my grandmother. You know, the, that, that, that pain was still living inside of her. She didn't want to have anything to do with a, a, a village that existed in her memory in ways that it didn't exist in these pictures. And I think, about my grandmother in that particular moment as a motivation for the type of work that we can and should do in academe, right? To, to create a world in which this sort of pain doesn't exist and isn't so common. And whenever a young black person is murdered by the police. I think of my grandmother in that moment. And whenever I read about missing and murdered indigenous women, I think about my grandmother. And whenever I hear about cases of, of sexual assault on campus going unreported and unprosecuted, I think about my <laughs> grandmother. And it occurs to me that if we're to do the sort of work that has any chance at all of undermining these forms of oppression, then we will be absolutely unable to do it in an environment that demands of us some ambiguous notion of civility. And uh, thank you very much. I appreciate it again. I'm happy to take questions or comments.